So, Professor Stajewski received his PhD degree from University of Texas, Dallas, and then he worked at Alcatel and afterwards at TI, where he started the Digital RF Processor Group in TI. And that group was instrumental in launching various digital intensive approaches to traditional RF functions. He also served as the CTO of this group between 2007 and 2009. In 2009, he joined Delft University in the Netherlands, where currently he is a part-time full professor. And since 2014, he's been a full professor at University College Dublin. He's authored various books, chapters, and holds 180 US patents. He's a co-founder of a startup company, Ecolabs, uh, that aims to build the first practical CMOS quantum computer. He's an IEEE fellow and a recipient of the CAS Industrial Pioneer Award. So now we'll move on to his talk, which is titled Beyond All Digital PLL for RF and Millimeter Wave Frequency Synthesis. You'll see the video very soon. And again, if you have any questions, please send, put, ask them in the chat window and we'll answer them at the end of the talk. Good afternoon. My name is Bogdan Staszewski and I would like to present to you the basics of all digital face lock loops. They got first developed for RF frequency synthesis, achieved low cost and state of the art performance and have been successfully used in a large share of cellular phones. Later on, they have been applied for millimeter wave. However, the millimeter wave 5G spec is very tough. So I will offer the next logical step in ADPLL that achieves sub 100 femtoseconds integrated jitter performance. Here is the outline of my presentation. I will start with a brief overview of RF design environment in nanometer scale CMOS. I will then go over the ADPLL basics and cover its fundamental building blocks, such as digital control oscillator and a time digital converter, as well as digital loop filter. I will then discuss key aspects of ADPLL, such as ultra-fast settling, direct frequency modulation for FM and polar transmit modulation, dithering and rotation of TDC for reduction of the fractional spurs. I will then cover a very important aspect in industry, which is self-calibration and self-testing. As I mentioned, the millimeter wave 5G spec is very tough and digital PLLs have difficulties in meeting it. So I will offer a new approach called uh, chart sharing locking. That is the next logical step in ADPLL development. I will conclude with some early experimental results. But first, what do we need an ADPLL for? It is used in RF as a local oscillator. It takes a frequency reference input clock in a typical range of 8 to 100 megahertz and multiplies it by the frequency command word, which is a fixed point number, meaning it has an integer and fractional part. The generated RF clock is in the megahertz range. The frequency reference or FREF can be coming from a, a VCTCXO, which is voltage controlled temperature compensated oscillator, or a, a digital controlled crystal oscillator, or a MEMS uh, resonator. The original motivation for this work was the fact that frequency synthesizers for RF used to be analog intensive. The top figure shows a charge pump PLL, which was used in virtually all commercial RF synthesizers. It was invented by Floyd Gardner in the 1960s and has worked amazingly well until the advent of uh, submicron CMOS. At around 130 nanometer CMOS node, the supply voltage would be low, around 1.2 volt, while the threshold voltage would be still around 0.6 volt. 
This does not leave much room for analog operations in the voltage domain. Further, the transistor's dynamic ch channel resistance would degrade, so difficulties with high-quality current sources in the charge pump. There will be more leakage, hence difficulty with high-quality capacitors in the loop filter. Moreover, the charge pump PLL does not operate in the phase domain, so no native fractional N operation possible. Instead of integrating an imperfect current on an imperfect capacitor, why not employ a perfect digital integrator as shown in the lower figure for an all-digital PLL? Here, there is a direct replacement of basic building blocks. The VCO uh, in the top gets replaced by a digital controlled oscillator DCO. The phase frequency detector uh, in the old days gets replaced by the time to digital converter and uh, the FCW frequency command word accumulator. Uh, the analog loop filter gets replaced with a digital loop filter. This brings us to the new paradigm of designing RF circuitry in advanced nanometer CMOS technology. So the supply voltages go down, while the threshold voltage stays relatively the same. At the same time, the noise goes up due to the full chip integration with a massive digital circuitry. Hence, the SNR, which is signal-to-noise ratio, will go down. The time domain, however, is free from such issues. There is no equivalent VDD limitations. Um, the limitations is simply application related, how long you can wait for something to finish. The edges are steeper with a 20 picoseconds rise time, which is getting better. The voltage domain noise has less chance of affecting the time domain noise, which is called jitter. So the mainstream CMOS technology is ready for the new paradigm of time domain RF signal processing. I guess it's time to use time. However, the new theory is still being developed, and there is some reluctance in the scientific and industrial communities to fully embrace it. To be successful in this new environment, we should exploit what is good about it and uh, we should avoid what is bad about the advancing most technology. So we need to take advantage of the fast switching characteristics of most transistors. We can flip the state uh, from logic zero to logic one of 28 nanometer CMOS transistors in 10 picoseconds. This corresponds to about 400 gigahertz of FT cutoff frequency. And good news is that uh, this swiftness improves 30% per, per process node, which is uh, somewhere between 18 to 24 months. Now, the small transistors, uh, small capacitors, have very good device matching, and that improves with the process uh, technology. Uh, of course, for a given uh, for a given um, uh, unit uh, size, not when you keep on uh, going to the minimum size uh, devices, but uh, nobody uses minimum size devices for analog uh, designs. Uh, now, in, the, in this advanced process technology, uh, there is a very high density of logic gates. We, we can cram in 2 million gates per millimeter square in this uh, 28 nanometer uh, process technology. This improves 2x with each process technology node, which, as I mentioned, is between 18 and 24 months. SRAM memory, uh, which is used uh, quite uh, liberally in uh, digital designs, has even better density. Uh, it can cram in 8 megabits per millimeter square. On the other hand, we should avoid uh, what this process is not good in, uh, which is biasing current for analog circuits. So you will see uh, that instead of biasing current uh, resistors, we should not rely on the voltage resolution because the VDD supply goes down, the threshold voltage roughly stays the same. So our uh, overhead voltage, uh, whatever we have left, uh, is not, does not amount to much. 
and we should avoid any non-standard devices that are not needed for memory and digital logic because again this process technology has been uh, developed for digital logic and memory not for analog signal processing the phase domain operation of adpll is quite a simple idea we need to have ideal equidistant reference timestamp called here expected timestamps. The generated or actual timestamp will deviate from the reference ones due to the jitter, which is the time domain noise. As per the, per the PDF distribution, PDF is probability density function distribution shown in the figure. The difference between these timestamps is our timing error. We take the timing error invert it and feed it into the oscillator to change the frequency. The system will thus work as a negative feedback loop. An astute listener will certainly protest such a simplistic idea. Obviously, the generated or actually timestamps, which are shown in red, are at a much higher rate than the reference or actual timestamps, which are shown in blue and that ratio can be real valued with a fractional part being non-zero. For this reason, we create a virtual clock with expected timestamps of the same frequency as the output. They are shown at the last uh, row. Now, the timing error detection is between the timestamps at the lowest two rows. Note that the virtual clock can have non-aligned timestamps as of the uh, input reference. The proposed solution is shown here. The top row shows the reference timestamps which can be generated by a crystal oscillator described at the beginning of this presentation. The expected variable timestamps for the 3.2 times frequency multiplication example are shown in the third row. The principle here is that the reference timestamps are measured by the variable clock, specifically by counting the periods. This seems contradictory, but it makes sense if you realize that the variable clock is much faster than the reference clock. In our example, when everything is perfect, the first measurement of the reference timestamp will be 3.2, uh, the second 6.4, the third 9.6, and so on. Note that the counting involves a fractional part, which will be later described as coming from a block called TDC, which is a time to digital converter. Now, if the clock is slower, as in the second row, the counts will be lower, as such as 2 and 2 thirds, 5 and 1 third, 8, and so on. On the other hand, if the clock is faster, as shown in the last row, the counts will be higher, such as 4, 8, 12, 16, and so on. In terms of hardware needed, we need an accumulator of the FCW, which is frequency command word, running at FREF, as shown in the top row. Uh, we also need a counter of the DCO clocks, the high speed counter of these uh, RF oscillator clocks, as shown in the second row. For the fractional part of the DCO period counting, we need ATDC, time to digital converter. To get the phase error, we just subtract the integer count and uh, the TDC interpolating output, their uh, uh, combination from the accumulated FC state, the phase domain operation of the all digital PLL. Uh, we have it on the right hand side, we have a, a DCO, digital control oscillator, producing high frequency RF clock. Uh, the system is being sampled by the frequency reference FREF coming from the left. You can see the FREF period is about 3.2 times longer than that of the CKV, which is the variable clock produced uh, by the uh, DCO. Since we don't care about the shape of the clock, we only care about the timestamps 
uh, that correspond to when the rising edges happen. Uh, we show the just below the uh, figure, uh, we show the timestamps in blue of the reference phase. Uh, so, of course, we start from zero, count from zero, that's our marker. Then the first uh, transition happens at uh, the time 3.2, uh, the second at 6.4, third at 9.6, then 12.8, uh, and so on. And remember, the count here is of the uh, DCO clock, of the expected uh, DCO clock. Uh, so this, these values come uh, by accumulating uh, the fixed point value 3.2 on every rising edge of FREF. So uh, when we start uh, from zero, uh, this, uh, this uh, accumulator, then on the first clock cycle, it will produce 3.2, then 6.4, 9.6, uh, and so on. So we will count, uh, we'll keep on counting uh, from zero to uh, infinity for as long as uh, we run uh, the system. Now, the DCO clock is running faster and uh, it's being counted uh, and its edges are being counted as integers. Uh, and uh, when frequency reference uh, rising edge comes uh, to the TDC, then the state will be sampled. So on the first rising edge of FREF, um, we are sampling the value of 3.2 simply because we have one, two, three uh, full edges of the DCO clock and 0.2, 20% uh, of the period uh, of the DCO clock. Then the second uh, sampling uh, will come at the position of uh, 6.4 because we have six full uh, cycles of the DCO clock and about 40% uh, in the middle, 40% roughly in the middle uh, of the DCO uh, cycle. Then the next count is going to be uh, 9.6 and so on. This corresponds to the ideal case where everything is being set uh, properly and there is no deviation of the DCO uh, frequency. So what happens uh, when the DCO is running uh, slower? Uh, its period is going to be longer. So instead of counting 3.2 uh, on the first uh, rising edge of the DCO, uh, as in our nominal example, we will count uh, two and two thirds uh, because it's running slower. So uh, we cannot count as many of the cycles. We count less of the cycles. Then the next one is going to be 5.3 and the next one is going to be uh, 8.0. Obviously, these values are smaller than what we expect and our expectations is uh, the top red uh, row and which also corresponds to the top uh, blue top green uh, row. So when we sub subtract uh, the actual values will get a positive uh, phase error. And the positive a phase error gets integrated and filtered by the loop filter which says hey Mr. DCO you're running too slow you need to increase the frequency. So by increasing the frequency its periods get shorter. So um, next time, instead of uh, counting um, 2.67 cycles, uh, we'll be counting a higher number than that. The situation uh, is uh, actually opposite uh, when the DCO frequency is higher. So instead of counting 3.2, uh, as in the nominal case, we'll be counting 4 because the period is getting shorter. On the second uh, FREF, uh, we are going to count eight and so on. Uh, because this value, these values are higher than the nominal case uh, when uh, after the subtraction, the, our phase error is going to be uh, s uh, less than zero. After passing through the loop filter, uh, it will go to the DCO and say, hey, DCO, please reduce your frequency because you're running uh, too fast. You need to uh, slow it down. So uh, as a consequence, uh, the period will go up. And the next time, in the next cycles, we are going to count less than these values. The DCO is at the heart of the ADPLL. 
It is constructed similar to the conventional VCO, which is voltage control oscillator, but instead of the analog tuning of the tank's capacitor, the tuning now is all digital. All these hundreds or even maybe even thousands of digital control lines individually place the respective capacitors in either a high or low capacitive state. There is absolutely no analog tuning. Since the input and output are digital, the loop around the DCO can be fully digital. The schematic shows the very first embodiment uh, of the DCO, which we did at Texas Instruments. The oscillator structure is rather conventional. The LC tank is differential and is sustained by the cross-coupled pair of M1 and M2 transistors. The digital controlled 6-bit resistor set the bias tail current. The tail resonator, uh, the smaller one, uh, filters out the second harmonic. However, unlike in the VCO, the capacitors here are all digital controlled by an analog quote-unquote inverter to place them in either high or low capacitive state. In this specific case, uh, there are the real varactors. Uh, 40 out of farad of stable capacitance step per LSB can be obtained. This corresponds to about 12 kilohertz step size at 2.4 gigahertz frequency. Of course, not all the varactors are the same. Some of them are coarser and some of them are finer. We have adopted a segmented approach. The largest varactors are for PVT adjustments. They are used to make sure that the center of the band is roughly at the center of the entire tuning range. Their step size is gigantic, 4 MHz per LSB. They are implemented as 6-bit binary arrangement, which is easy to ensure monotonicity. The actual channel selection is done by the acquisition of actors. The step is mid-course at 200 kHz per LSB. The actual transmission and reception is done with the finest 12 kHz tracking bank varactors that can reliably make uh, in the non-nanoscale non CMOS technology. This corresponds to about 40 autofarad of capacitance step. However, even this 40 autofarad is still too coarse because it corresponds to 12 kilohertz, and 12 kilohertz is too coarse for Bluetooth, GSM, and any other system. We need a much finer resolution, so we dedicate another small bank of the finest tracking varactors uh, for the sigma delta dithering. Note that the acquisition and tracking bank are unit weighted since the linearity is important. Another view of the DCO banks is shown on the right. The cross-coupled transistors are NMOS at the bottom and PMOS at the top. In the middle, we have the inductor and four varactor banks. The tracking fractional bank is connected to a third order MASH sigma delta modulator clocked by the DCO clock, which is divided by eight. The third order MASH sigma delta modulator is digital and it's shown on the left. It consists of three accumulators. Each accumulator output is fed to the next stage. The accumulator carry out <coughs> bits are combined and fed to the varactors. One issue with the sigma delta modulator is that for a constant input, it produces a repeatable tone, which can generate spurs at the DCO output. For a noisy oscillator, it is normally not a problem. However, for high performance system, it could be an issue. So to break the periodic pattern, the input to the second accumulator is randomized. Another interesting idea to improve resolution of the DCO is shown here. A capacitor at the bottom of the cross-coupled transistor pair, which is at the source, will reflect to the top, which is at the drains, as a negative capacitor. 
the equation in the middle right shows an admittance which consists of a negative resistance from the cross-coupled transistors pair and a negative capacitor. The negative capacitor value is actually massively scaled down by the denominator. This method can produce a step size as fine as 1 kHz, which means that no dithering is needed. Now, let's talk about the time to digital converter, or TDC. The TDC idea is actually quite simple. The structure consists of an inverter chain coupled to an array of flip-flops. The high-speed DCO clock goes through the inverter chain and produces a vector of delayed clocks, called here the bus D. The vector of delayed clock is sampled by the array of flip-flops at each rising edge of the reference clock FREF. The outputs of the flip-flop uh, called bus D contain a pseudo-thermometer code, which then goes to a binary encoder. The output of the encoder is a small integer number, which tells how many inverters we have between the rising edge of FREF and the previous rising edge of the DCO clock. In this example, the one to zero transition on the Q bus at the bottom right uh, on the flip-flops happens at position 6, meaning that there are 6 inverters between the rising edge of FREF and the previous rising edge of the DCO. The TDC output is a small binary number in terms of the number of inverters, which is a subject to process, voltage and temperature variations. This is obvious since the inverter delay here, it is 10 picoseconds nominal, but it can change from 5 to 20 picoseconds over the PVT. The ADPLL, however, expects the TDC to produce the interpolated number from 0 to 1, which is independent from the process voltage and temperature effects. This is easily fixed by performing a normalization. Here, we need we get the numbers from the raw TDC. On the left drawing, we have delta TR, one number, and delta TF, another number. Delta TR, as we have already mentioned, is the number of inverters from the rising edge of FREF to the previous rising edge of the CKV. The second TDC output, delta TF, is the count of how many inverters we have between the rising edge of FREF and the previous falling edge of CKV. When we subtract these two numbers, we get the count of inverters per half period of the CKV clock. When we multiply that by two, we get a number of inverters per full cycle of the CKV. The inverse of that number is our normalizing multiplier value. The output of that multiplier called epsilon is between zero and one and is the interpolated value of the PLL phase domain operation. The TDC core is part of a larger TDC, which also contains the counter of the CKV edges. The TDC, after the normalization, produces the fractional value of the variable phase. The counter, on the other hand, produces the integer part of the variable phase. When we join these two parts together, we obtain a fixed point value of the variable phase, which is then fed to the phase detector to produce the phase error that makes the ADPLL operating as negative loop. We have previously learned about the DCO that generates a digital clock carrier with a frequency proportional to its digital input. The phase of that variable digital carrier is detected by the TDC. The TDC is that a digital replacement of the conventional phase frequency detector and a charge pump. The desired frequency is set by the FCW, which is the frequency command word, and it's a fixed point number comprising an integer and a fractional part. The FCW gets accumulated in order to produce the reference phase. 
the variable phase produced by the TTC is compared to the reference phase in order to calculate uh, the phase error. Now, since we have covered the TTC, I can introduce two types of ADPLL topologies. The original ADPLL architecture is shown at the bottom. This is what we have covered, and uh, this is what went into high volume production at Texas Instruments in the early 2000s. A few years after publishing the original architecture, other groups started propagating the other ADPLL architecture shown at the top. At first, I was surprised. Why would anybody use uh, an architecture that does not operate in the phase domain, hence propagating many issues found with the previous charge pump PLL. Then it became clear that a particular technology uh, topology is a direct replica of the previous arrangement. So if your company has a wealth of experience with a traditional charge pump based PLL, then the upper diagram would make more sense. Uh, you just start replacing one block at a time uh, with, a di with its digital equivalent. Even the multi-modulus frequency divider and the sigma delta modulator can be directly reused. From the signal flow perspective, the two architecture are quite similar. Also, the additional quantization noise from the frequency divider at the top will somewhat affect uh, the performance. However, the biggest difference is the TDC range that is required. It is always less than the full cycle of the DCO clock in the original ADPLL. The structure at the top requires a much wider range, especially during the initial uh, settling, um, in which that range can be the whole reference period, which could be two orders of magnitude greater than the DCO period. When the loop is settled, however, the range is smaller, but still it must cover several DCO cycles due to the sigma delta uh, operation of the multimodulus divider. Note that designing a wide linear range TDC is very difficult and power hungry uh, when one cares about linearity. Unlike the charge pump PLL, which produces a train of pulses at the frequency of reference rate, the ADPLL operates in the phase domain, hence it does not produce any reference spurs. Consequently, no real filtering of the phase error is required. The phase error corrections signal shown on the left is just a digital signal whose value is proportional uh, to the timing separation between the variable and reference edges. In fact, the ADPLL used in the Bluetooth products does not have any phase error filter, and it works just fine. The phase error digital samples get multiplied by the proportional coefficient alpha, whose value is a negative power of two number. This saves hardware by avoiding a multiplier. In parallel, the phase error samples get integrated by the accumulator. The accumulated phase error uh, gets scaled uh, by the integral coefficient uh, rho, which is also uh, which, which is also uh, designed as a negative power of two number. We save lots of digital gates by avoiding the, these two multipliers and using instead the right bit shift operators. The proportional and integral loops uh, are combined at the output. Uh, we have two knobs to control the characteristics of the loop uh, filter, which is alpha, the proportional, and rho, the integral. For more demanding applications, such as GSM, which require protection of the alternate channel at 400 kilohertz offset from the transmitted channel, we have to use an IR filter. This filter attenuates the reference and TDC quantization noise at 400 kilohertz offset. It is a powerful four-stage cascade of single pole IR filters. 
since uh, this IR filter uh, can be generally unstable, we have to resort to using the unconditionally stable leaky integrators, whose equation is shown in the right. Its coefficients, lambda, it's also power of two. Therefore, the cascade of four such single uh, pole uh, filters will be also unconditionally stable. A more detailed block diagram of ADPLL is shown here. The frequency command word, FCW, gets integrated by the reference phase accumulator producing R sub R samples. The DCO edges uh, are accumulated by the variable accumulator. The count in the, is then sampled by the frequency reference clock producing R sub V samples. Uh, the TDC core produces a small integer uh, indicating the timing separation between the frequency of reference and the DCO edges. That timing separation is in the units of an inverted delay. The <coughs> integer gets normalized by the DCO period normalizer, which produces sampled called epsilon. The sample DCO uh, variable phase, together with a fractional TDC correction epsilon, gets subtracted from the reference phase. This will produce the phase error sample called, samples called phi underscore e. The phase error goes through the loop filter and then, then gets normalized and adjusts the DCO frequency in a negative feedback manner. As mentioned, the ADPLL operates in the phase domain using digitally synchronous fixed point arithmetic. The signals are digital and cannot be corrupted by noise. It should be pointed out that the true phase domain operation has a problem of a digital signal going to infinity. For an infinitely long operation, we would need log 2 of n number of binary bits, which is also infinite. To solve this problem, we resort to so-called modular arithmetics. Instead of having an in infinite line going from zero to infinity, we wrap around a very large number back to zero. Geometrically, a line that is turned into a circle. The two uh, faces, which is the variable and reference, are now visualized as, a, as rotating vectors along the circle. The angle between them is the phase error, phi of e. In the example on the right, modulo 16 is used. So in this example, after the count of 15, uh, 15 is reached, a zero is traversed again. Uh, the variable phase update is very frequent uh, at the DCO clock rate, but, but a count of one which is the smallest one. The reference phase update R sub R is infrequent, but the reference rate by, by the reference rate, but is done by large step of the FCW, which is much higher than one. Despite the wraparound, the proper phase error is always produced in this modulo arithmetic. A functional block diagram is shown on the left. On every rising edge of the CKV clock, the accumulated value R sub V of I gets incremented. In this 8-bit example, after reaching a value of 255, the next count will be zero. This accomplishes the modular 2 to the power 8 arithmetic. On each rising edge of the reference clock, the high-speed counter will be sampled. This incrementer might have some difficulties in operating at gigahertz clocks, especially when the process corner is low and the supply voltage is low. The drawing on the right increases the operational speed through pipelining. It divides the word length of 8 bits into lower uh, 2 bits and uh, higher 6 order bits. The carry out from the lower 2 bits uh, triggers the increment in the higher order bits. 
any digital system with two asynchronous clocks will have a metastability issue. The two clocks, the reference and the DCO, are completely synchronous to each other when the system starts. Even after the synthesizer has locked, there will be a periodical phase rotation in a general case of a fractional N operation. The metastability problem cannot be really solved. It can only be mitigated. Our approach is to resample the reference clock by the DCO clock in this red retiming flip-flop shown on the left. This way, all the digital logic circuitry will be run by the CKR clock that is synchronous to CKV, but whose frequency is that of the reference. However, we still have to solve the problem of metastability of that particular red flip-flop. It is important to reiterate these points. The two clocks in the ADPLL, the reference and variable, are not entirely synchronous, despite being in phase lock. The digital logic will exhibit metastability when transferring the data from one domain to the other. The solution is to oversample the reference clock by the oscillator clock as shown on the left. Mathematically, this can be described as a ceiling operation. The CKV timestamps are integers as shown on the right. The FREF timestamps are real valued. The retimed reference clock CKR timestamps uh, are the integer valued. The retiming operation is that a mathematical ceiling operation. Of course, we cannot do rounding because that would imply time non-causality. To address the metastability problem between the reference and oscillator clocks, we must try to avoid it by picking the oscillator clock edge, rising or falling, that is further away from the metastability. As shown in the bottom, the reference clock is resampled at the same time by the rising and falling edges of the DC clock. At most, only one of them could be metastable, but certainly not both of them. At the time of resampling, we simply do not know which one is free or farther away from metastability. That decision is done by the arbiter. Like in real life, the arbiter is something or someone that is in, in the middle of the two parties. Here, the arbiter is a signal that is right in the middle between the rising and falling edges of the DCO clock. We use the existing hardware the tab delay line of the TDC to pick that delayed signal through the mid-edge selector. In a way, that metastability gets mitigated in a flash ADC. Here, we can also use bubble correction, but it is typically not necessary in advanced CMOS because of extremely high GM and very low capacitances. Thus, GM over C gets very high. To help better understand the metastability resolution, we have two timing diagrams at the bottom. On the left, the rising reference edge is dangerously close to the falling CKV edge. Therefore, we cannot use the retimed signal Q sub N. The MAX has to select the QP signal. In the case of the right-hand side timing diagram, the reference edge is dangerously close to the rising CKV edge. In this case, the max select the signal Q sub N. That solution from the previous slide actually went into high volume production. In the meanwhile, we found an improvement for another product. Just as in the previous case, the reference gets retimed by the rising and falling edges of the DC clock and the arbiter signal called cell underscore edge picks the better candidate for the CKR clock. Here, the lower three bits are always incremented by the asynchronous counter on the rising edges of the CKV, but the count state gets sampled by the two candidates of the retimed reference clock. So we are making speculative sampling by the speculative clocks. In the end, the correct 3-bit candidate will get selected by the MAX. The 6 
higher order bits get incremented by a synchronous counter operated by the DCO clock divided by 8. The 6-bit state gets sampled by the CKR clock. The old digital PLL is a sampled digital system. So it can be most accurately represented by the Z domain model, as shown in the block diagram. The DCO has a certain gain, called KDCO, in the units of kilohertz per LSB. It is subject to PVT, process voltage temperature, so it must be normalized by the multiplier, FR divided by KDCO hat, where hat symbol stands for an estimate. In the middle of the loop, we have a loop filter that consists of a proportional and integral paths. The phase error, phi underscore E, gets filtered by the IR filter before being multiplied by the coefficient alpha. The phase detector here is implemented as a frequency detector, followed by an accumulator. We have several knobs to adjust the characteristics of the loop. There are the proportional and integral coefficient, alpha and rho, these are the two most important ones, as well as four IR filter coefficients, lambda. Remember, the IR filter is a cascade of four single stage uh, filters. That's, we have six knobs in total. The loop can be set in either type one or type two. And remember, the type uh, designates the number of uh, integrators uh, in the system. The closed loop ADPLL characteristic can be obtained by first deriving its open loop characteristic. This can be done by breaking the loop somewhere, say at the negative feedback input of the phase detector, and then traversing the path from the beginning to end. The open loop transfer function equation is shown in the right. Here, however, it is expressed in S domain as it is more intuitive for us humans to understand. The transfer function with six coefficients can be of sixth order, so it is impossible to get a closed form mathematical equation. In this case, we must resort to our old friend MATLAB. For the closed loop transfer function plots, I show here um, on the left, uh, from the, there is a transfer function plot from the reference and TDC inputs, and on the right for the DCO input. For the coefficient settings, as shown in the second bullet, we have 33 dB of attenuation of the reference noise at 400 kilohertz offset. On the variable path, we have second order 40 dB per second filtering of the flicker noise at the lower frequencies. Since the loop is digital, this transfer function can be set precisely. The precision of the transfer function has been verified in lab measurements. All the curves in the plot on the right, except for the pink one, are mathematical fits of measured individual components. So, the dotted blue curve models the DCO thermal and flicker noise based on the best fit with the measurement. The solid blue curve is the DCO noise after applying the Z domain transfer function of the ADPLL. The green curve is the measured DDC quantization noise after the loop filtering. The red curve is the measured reference noise and after the loop filtering. When we add these three noise sources, uh, the DCO, reference, and TDC, we obtain the solid black curve, which is almost identical with the measured pink curve, except for the flicker noise region around 1 kHz, which is anyway very difficult to measure. Due to the digital phase domain operation, the ADPLL can acquire its lock extremely fast. It can easily settle to a new channel within 5 to 20 microseconds, or even faster. To accomplish this, three techniques are used. The first one is the DCO bank switchover from the coarse to mid-coarse and then to fine. The second one 
is the gear shift of the loop filter coefficients. The third technique is the zero phase restart. The new channel can be quickly acquired by first using the big PVT varactors. If you still remember, the LSB step is 4 MHz, so hundreds of MHz can be traversed in a matter of nanoseconds after arriving in the, in the right frequency neighborhood. The acquisition of our actors are used. Uh, their step is smaller at 200 kilohertz, but the actual transmission and reception is done using the finest 12 kilohertz step varactors. So we traverse from the very large to mid-large and then to finest uh, varactors consecutively. We perform the gear shifting when using the tracking bank varactor. The gear shift hardware is shown here. The phase error phi of E sub E is first multiplied by the coefficient alpha 1. During the gear shift, the coefficient is changed from alpha 1 to alpha 2. If the phase error has a DC curve, DC value, as it should, then there will be a hit at the normalized tuning word output. Since this is a digital circuit, that hit, called delta phi, can be calculated exactly according to the equation in the middle. That calculation is done by the calc block such that the adjustment is made during the sh gear shifting moment. Without doing anything special, uh, we can we have measured the settling time in one of our products to be 23 microseconds, as shown in the left. Uh, there was a paper from Japan uh, as long as 10 years ago that actually reported 4 microseconds settling time in a type 1 ADPLL. There are many other publications after that that reported even better settling times. Even though the ADPLL bandwidth can be conveniently set to say 100 kilohertz in order to balance the reference and oscillator noise, it can easily perform the digital modulation of signals with bandwidths in the tens of megahertz range, thus orders of magnitude higher. This is done using a two-point modulation. The modulating data frequency command word, data FCW, directly feeds the DCO tracking bank varactors. However, that could be perceived by the loop as the DCO noise. So we must tell the DCO uh, that this is a good noise uh, by compensating, uh, compensating it, which is done by subtracting the phase error in the reference feed. In the end, the two contributions, which is the feed forward and compensating, cancel each other so that the phase error will not be affected. For this scheme to work, the DCO gain must be set precisely. If not, there will be overshoots. Here is the Z domain diagram of the ADPLL with the two points modulation capability. The modulating signal delta FM feeds into the ADPLL at two points, the DCO and the reference. The DCO tuning word multiplier must be set precisely. That precision can be quite coarse. In the receive mode, when, where any misestimate will only change the ADPLL bandwidth. In the transmit mode, however, the KDCO precision should be as high as 1%. The DCO gain estimation can be done quite easily and automatically as shown in the diagram. At first, the channel is acquired at a slightly higher frequency by delta F. After the settling, the data FCW is suddenly dropped by delta F. If the KDCO was set precisely to start with, then there will be a perfect uh, step frequency change of delta F according to the equation at the top right. However, if the KDCO was not set properly, then the frequency of jump will be too low or too high. The loop will detect it, however, and within a few time constants uh, of the loop bandwidth, the proper frequency delta F will be reached. We can easily measure 
the change in the oscillator tuning word delta OTW since it is digital. So with a high precision, we can calculate the KDCO according to that equation. It is important to point out that we do, need, do not need any external test equipment to perform this estimation. It can be done in a fully autonomous way before each packet is transmitted or received. So any changes in the temperature or voltage can be compensated in real time. All these described techniques can be put together to realize a robust all digital PLL that can support wide bandwidth modulation. What's more, it can support any reference frequency from any crystal. Thus, the two functions, which is the phase error correction and modulation, can be entirely decoupled. A detailed block diagram of one of our products is shown here. The block, which we haven't yet seen uh, in this presentation, is the sample rate converter, SRC, <clears throat> right in the middle, just before the DCO. It transferred the reference clocked samples to the variable clock domain. On the reference path, the high-speed modulating data samples get zero order held and resampled by this ZOH block. The pulse-shaped filtering of the transmit data is done on the clocks, which are 100% derived from the DCO. Hence, they have no relevance to the frequency <coughs> reference of the crystals, as the two clock domains are completely decoupled. The most recent trend, which is especially important in 5G systems, is to reduce spurious tones in a fractional N operation. It is diffi extremely difficult to get them below minus 50 dBc without resorting to some very complex and power-hungry schemes. Here, we offer a very simple alternative. The DCO typically runs at the 2x frequency of the generated carrier. Hence, it is divided by a quadrature divider. We can exploit the four equidistant edges of the CQV clock to perform phase rotation, thus translating the DCO frequency a bit on the feedback path before feeding it to the TDC. The details are shown here. Normally, we would always pick one of the four clocks, say I+. However, here we rotate the clock selection every reference event. So at first we pick I+, plus, then we pick Q+, plus, then I-, minus, then Q-, minus, and then we come back to the I plus selection. The TDC will see the feedback clock not, only, not of the original period of three units, but of the three and a quarter units. So the frequency of the DCO clock seen by the TDC is that shifted lower. The problem of fractional uh, spurs falling in the, into the loop bandwidth of the ADPLL can thus be avoided by this phase rotation technique. The scheme works uh, quite well as shown in the measurement results. The blue spectral plot is before applying this technique and the red one is after engaging the phase rotation. The fractional spurs are almost gone. They are not completely gone because there is still a parasitic path from the crystal's harmonic right into the sensitive tank of the oscillator. The digital phase error signal can also be used to perform self-estimation of the ADPLL performance. The RMS value of the phase error is internally calculated by the script processor hardware. The calculated value is close to the RMS phase error as measured by the external spectrum analyzer. This gives us a wonderful opportunity to perform built-in self-testing and built-in self-calibration that will save precious resources during the factory testing mm -hmm. and also while in the field in the customer hands. It took a long automated sweep to measure this data. The internally captured phase error, RMS, as part of BIST, 
which is the blue, and the measured RMS, uh, which is in red, are plotted across all channels in the GSM. They show a very high correlation and the efficiency of the building self-test. All these techniques and some more of the All Digital PLL have been described in my 2000 book, which was then translated into Japanese. The book came from internal TI documentation, which later became my PhD thesis. Since it took many years to get all the necessary permissions from TI to get it all published, this work stems from actually much earlier. The fundamental patents were submitted to the US Patent Office in the year 2000, and here is the list. With this slide, I would like to conclude the first part of my presentation. I have presented the technical evolution of all digital PLL and then described several of its sophisticated features, such as ultra-fast settling, direct frequency modulation, multi-rate operation, and avoidance of fractional spurs. The ADPLL architecture has been proven in high volume production, and it is still subject to intensive research in both academia and industry. The first part of my presentation was about the ADPLLs. They are in high volume production now. They cover a wide range of frequency, as you can see on the survey map marked with Rex squares. However, from the strict point of view of performance, uh, which is needed for millimeter wave 5G wireless, the trend is to go to subsampling PLLs or injection locked oscillators. The ADPLLs do not boast the record low jitter at millimeter wave, which is kind of embarrassing. So our task was to go back to the drawing board. But let us look uh, first at the two other competing solutions. The first of those high performance millimeter wave PLLs is subsampling. The millimeter wave sinusoidal signal voltage is sampled on the sampling capacitor on each rising edge of the frequency reference clock. Of course, an isolating buffer is needed to present the glitch kickback from the sampling operation. It can natively work only in integer n, so the same zero crossing portion of the sinusoid would be sampled over and over again. Like in a non-lock charge pump PLL, also here a large analog loop filter is required. Unfortunately, the locking range is very narrow, so a separate frequency locking loop is needed. It requires a high-speed divider, and thus it consumes significant power. Also, millimeter wave VCOs are known for poor thermal and flicker phase noise. The second of these high-performance millimeter wave frequency synthesizers is an injection-locked oscillator. Every rising edge of the frequency reference, the charge on the LC tank capacitor gets momentarily reset. This adjusts the oscillating phase. We can thus say that the oscillator gets injection-locked uh, to the reference. The size of the switch determines the strength of the injection. So with a reasonable size switch, we can get a very wide band PLL bandwidth. The power and area are saved by not needing the isolating buffer. Unfortunately, if the resonating frequency is not perfectly aligned with the nth harmonic of reference, then there will be spurious tones. Hence, an additional frequency loop is required. This will also cause a timing racing condition between injection locked and frequency tuning locking, in which the phase error might be corrected by the injection locked before the FTL even uh, senses it. A few months ago, we have proposed a new phase locking idea called chattering locking, CSL that combines the best features of the subsampling and injection locking. Here, the LC tank on the right is periodically and momentarily chattered with another capacitor C share, C sub share. Unlike in the injection locking, which short circuits the tank's capacitor to ground, here 
we can precharge the tank's capacitor to a desired voltage, which is especially important for a native fraction line support. So if the C share voltage is always zero and the cap is very large, then this whole thing reduces to the injection locking. The operation is very simple. The digital word is loaded on the rising edge of the high-speed clock on the left. When the clock is high, C-share, the capacitor in the middle, voltage is preset by the DAC. The switch S1 then gets disconnected and switch S2 momentarily connects C-share with a tank right at the rising edge of F frequency reference. During this time, the two capacitors get charge shared. The first equation below the drawing models the voltage step delta V shares share during the charge sharing process. If the charge sharing capacitor is small, then the new V share voltage copies the tank's voltage at the process of sampling, at the instance of sampling. This is akin to subsampling. However, if the sharing capacitor is large, then the tank's capacitor copies its voltage, which means that this will preset the oscillator phase. This is more like the injection locking. For the case when both capacitors are roughly the same, the oscillator's voltage will move halfway between its current voltage and the desired voltage. Hence, the oscillator's phase will be adjusted in the right direction. We can control the adjustment strength, thus the implicit negative loop bandwidth with a digital control of the C share size, which is difficult to realize in injection locking. The phase locking can be done by picking any voltage on the resonating waveform. The middle plot shows the zero locking by the sampling of reference clock that is half the oscillating frequency. The clocking can also be on the sinusoidal peak voltage as shown in the bottom plot. The zero crossing locking can happen on either rising or falling edges. Here is the first case. In the middle, uh, the short reference pulse comes right at the zero crossing. Since the V-share capacitor is precharged to ground, there will be no change. If, however, the sinusoid's phase is delayed, which means its frequency is too low at the left plot, the tank's negative voltage will be pulled to ground, thus advancing the phase. If, on the other hand, the phase is advanced, which means its frequency is too high, then the positive tank's voltage during the sampling instance will be pulled over. That's delaying the phase. As you can see, there is a linear relationship between the frequency and v share. However, of course, however, uh, for the falling edge sampling, the relationship will be opposite. This will cause a positive feedback, but with a metastability twist. The problem is also common in subsampling and injection locking. To solve this ambiguity, we propose initial locking on the peak. It will lock all right, but the value of delta V share cannot distinguish the polarity of frequency error. Just for completeness, we can also do bottom sampling. So the situation is similar there. Here we summarize the possible cases of various locking points. The delta V share or the step on the C share capacitor is exploited to implement the digital frequency tracking loop. The voltage change before and after the sampling is read out by a small ADC and adjust the resonant frequency. After digitize, the samples get filtered and accumulated. The new phase of voltage residue reading on C share is marked mark in red as S3. At the bottom right, uh, it says if the sampled voltage tends to be negative, then the tank's capacitor goes down and vice versa. 
I said tens because uh, there is filtering and accumulation involved. So we are looking at longer term averages. So this FTL or frequency tracking loop eliminates the timing race problem in injection locked loops. The ADC itself is implemented as a 6-bit SAR ADC. That's consuming very little power. Unlike in ADPLLs, the switch cap banks in DCO can be quite coarse and do not require any sigma delta dithering. The FTL loops is just temporary and only needs to be approximately to bring the frequency close to the target. The FTL loop does not perform any phase correction. The actual implementation of the oscillator is quadrature due to its intended application in millimeter wave 5G. Perhaps it is beyond the scope of this presentation, but here is the block diagram of an IQ uh, transmitter. The oscillator generates 28 GHz clock, uh, gets fed to the I and Q paths of the DAC, the outputs get summed and fed to the power amplifier and power amplifier can produce a wide band uh, signal. The quadrature oscillator comprises two source coupled class F oscillators running at around 10 gigahertz, but co-generating at the same time the third harmonic at around 30 gigahertz. The third harmonic gets extracted by the harmonic extractor uh, circuits in the right. The detail architecture is shown here. During each reference clock cycle, the DAG precharges C-share capacitor, which is then charged with a tank to move its face in the right direction. The resulting residual face on C-share is sampled by the SAR ADC and used to tune the tank's resonant frequency. The FTL operates every fourth clock, hence at a much lower frequency. The signaling is differential for mitigating the common mode and leakage. The quadrature sampling is for the purpose of fast acquisition, as will be explained in the next few slides. As discussed earlier, to solve the problem of rising and falling edge ambiguity of injection lock PLLs, here we propose a two-step locking. At first, the oscillator phase is unknown uh, so the Q oscillator, the quadrature part of the IQ oscillator, which is shown here by the blue sign, is forced to the peak. In the second step, the sampling is switched to the I oscillator, the in-phase oscillator, and its voltage, now red sign, is forced to ground. Consequently, the locking will be very swift and free from metastability. The third phase, uh, which is done by the switch S3, is the charge sharing of the C share, which is the central capacitor, with the C SAR, the capacitor but that belongs to the ADC, which is made, the whole thing, a detection part of the FDL loop. The charge sharing switch uses bootstrapping with adaptive bias, body biasing uh, of the M, SW transistor, the one in the blue. The tank is connected via VGIP and VGIN uh, at the right. When the blue switch is on, the body connects uh, to the source to get lower channel resistance and better linearity. When the main transistor is off, the body connects to the ground to increase its channel resistance uh, and offers better isolation. To demonstrate the effectiveness of the proposed charge sharing locking technique, the quadrature class F oscillator with harmonic extractors were fabricated in TSMC 28 nanometer LP CMOS process technology. Uh, the chip occupies a 0.5 millimeter square area. The synthesizer produces a very low phase noise output. Uh, it measures minus 110 dBc per hertz phase noise at 26 uh, megahertz output, 
with the integrated jitter of only 76 femtoseconds. The reference spurs are 45 dB below the carrier. As expected, the core uh, of charging locking system maintains a narrow lock. However, the FTL is very effective in fully extending it. You can see by sweeping the supply voltage from 0.35 to 0.45 voltage, uh, the jitter uh, readout is maintained. The plot shows that the measured phase noise shows good stability across the whole tuning range. Here, we compare our new chattering locking synthesizer with other best performing solutions. We reach state of the art jitter performance level and best FOM figure of merit considering the number of phases. This is just the beginning. We are very excited about this. We are now exploring the native fractional end operation via the DAC loading as shown on the bottom plot. According to our system level simulations in Verilog AMS, uh, we should be able to reach the same 76 femtosecond level of integrated jitter in fractional end operation. Here are the simulation results. To conclude the second part of my presentation, we have shown the next logical step after the ADPLL development for high-performance millimeter wave synthesizers. Uh, for 5G millimeter wave applications, it is important uh, for the frequency synthesizer to feature sub-100 femtosecond integrated jitter. Uh, since it must use 256 QAM in uh, these uh, 28, 39 GHz uh, bands. Uh, we are proposing a charge sharing locking in which a big capacitor, C share, uh, with a pre preset voltage briefly connects with the LC tank for a phase correction. And this creates a proportional uh, path uh, for this implicit. Uh, phase lock loop. <clears throat> now, the charge sharing residue after that operation is being used for frequency tracking, which uh, implements the integral part. Um, it's very digitally oriented, only the digital control oscillator, digital to amplitude converter, and analog to digital converter switches and other digital circuits are needed. Uh, no biasing circuit needed at all. Uh, this approach scales very well with uh, CMOS technology scaling. Um, net result is that we can achieve ultra-low jitter, 75 femtoseconds at ultra-low power for millimeter wave quadrature frequency synthesis. This idea is naturally extendable for fractional and phase modulation, FMCW radars, and so on. Thank you very much for your attention. So that uh, concludes the talk uh, of the speaker. And uh, now it's time for Q&A. So um, I'll, I'll be reading the question. And uh, uh, Bogdan, uh, are, are you online? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Hi, Bogdan. Hi. All right. So I'll, I'll read the question. Uh, so the first question is uh, regarding the charge shared locking. So the question is, um, how can one think about uh, the PLL bandwidth and the reference noise filtering profile in your charge shared lock PLL? OK, uh, thanks for the question. Um, this is a very interesting one, and we have spent quite a bit of time uh, discussing this. Um, I think the answer should be on slide 59, or at least an indication of, this, of the answer. Um, how do we go about this? Uh, can you go to uh, pay slide 59? Yes, give me a second. Turn 
on my screen share. Can you see my screen? 59. Are you able to see the slide number 59? Oh, oh, this is a different. OK, sorry. Um, sorry. Um, this is this is the first version. Um, can you go to the slide uh, which says how large C share for the chattering locking? Uh, let me go to the original version. Uh, no, please. If you tell me the slide number. OK. Uh, yeah, this is the previous version slide. Uh, Slide um, 70, 78. Sorry for that. Seven, eight. Okay. So, um, so the bandwidth, uh, unlike in the uh, injection locking, uh, which basically has difficulty changing the bandwidth uh, because you have a tank, uh, LC tank, right? Uh, and here uh, in the injection locking, uh, instead of having C share, uh, you have just short circuit to a uh, AC ground, right? It could be a real ground or it could be VDD, VDD and ground for differential uh, operation. So think a bit about this as a AC ground. Uh, now with a C share, uh, with a capacitor, we can basically control the strength of this capacitor. So um, here in this example, uh, in this slide, uh, we have uh, the case where C share is the same as C OSC. Uh, and in this case, uh, there will be 50% of charge distribution during the charge uh, sharing. Uh, so it means that uh, the, 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 the oscillator, the tank, uh, will get half of the contributions. It will go halfway where it's supposed to be, and the C share will get, will get half of the, of the voltage. Uh, to better understand this, let's go two slides before that. Uh, so, sorry, go to the next slide. The next next slide, yeah, this one. So uh, it, here, here, uh, the charge. Uh, this is slide seventy-eight. Yeah. So uh, here, the C share is very is very small, uh, meaning that the uh, the tank's capacitor uh, will not be perturbed. Uh, all the voltage uh, from the tank uh, will be copied on the C share, so we can sample it later on, do whatever we want. Um, uh, but the tank's capacitor will not be affected. So you can think of this uh, system as a very narrow loop bandwidth. Uh, and uh, we like to equal, equate this with the subsampling. Uh, the opposite uh, is the case when the C share is extremely large. If you can go to the next slide. Yeah, when uh, when uh, the C share, C share is very large, uh, then uh, short circuiting S2 momentarily uh, will make it almost the same as injection locking. Uh, means that uh, the C share would act as a as a uh, momentarily would would act as a short circuit, so it will do uh, injection locking, and you can control the si the size of C share. 
and by controlling the size of C share, you can control the loop bandwidth. And uh, pretty much you can get uh, best of both worlds. Uh, you can get uh, by controlling this, the size of this uh, capacitor, which can be done digitally, uh, you can uh, increase or decrease the loop bandwidth at will. Okay. Okay. Uh, another question is um, is on injection pooling. So, uh, is it correct to understand that injection pooling is more significant when the aggressor and victim frequencies are close by? Um, yes, the relationship is actually uh, twenty dB per decade uh, for decade of the frequency difference between the two. And when we are talking about the frequency difference, we are talking about the harmonics, right? So so if we have aggressor uh, of lower frequency, let's say reference frequency, uh, but the clock is very squarish, it will have lots of harmonics. And one of these harmonics will be in the vicinity of the, uh, of the LC tank, resonant tank. So when we subtract these two frequencies, uh, meaning the resonant frequency of the tank and the nth harmonic uh, of the aggressor, uh, if they are nearby, then that uh, frequency delta uh, will make the <clears throat> injection pooling uh, strength proportional to how small the difference is, right? So the closer it is, the better it is. Um, so the worst case injection uh, pooling will be when uh, these two frequencies are very close to each other. However, uh, I need to point out that if uh, they are perfectly aligned, there won't be an injection injection pooling because uh, there will be a perfect uh, frequency relationship uh, between them. Um is there also any recommendation on the spacing rule between the aggressor inductor and the victim inductor to reduce the injection pooling? Uh, well, obviously, the farther away they are, the better it is, right? Uh, but uh, there are different paths, right? Uh, there is a path which is magnetic, so electromagnetic. Right, so obviously the farther away, uh, the better it is. Uh, another path will be through, through substrate, right? So uh, that doesn't really decrease much with uh, with the distance. Another path would be through uh, grounding uh, and the supply. Uh, if they are, if the ground is weak, uh, if the supply is weak, uh, there is not internal filtering. Then obviously uh, the aggressor will travel very long before you do that. So uh, you need to apply very good techniques to do that. So so the, the physical shear separation might not fix the, all the problems simply because the, the, the sneaky path could be through substrate or it could be through uh, VDD and uh, v, 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 VSS. OK, so that answers the two questions. Let me just quickly see. Uh, if we have any other question, and seems like we don't, but we also right on time. So let me take the opportunity to thank uh, the speaker who's given an excellent talk. Um, and uh, uh, we now will take uh, a 13 minute break and we'll be back um, at um, 10.45 for our next talk by Professor Sudhakar Pamati. So I'll go on mute and I'll come back.